Hey mom, did you know that there's a Momxiety Club membership? When you join, you'll get access to a wonderfully supportive group of moms where you can ask whatever questions or just vent if that's what you need. There's also weekly exercise classes to give your body and mind a little boost so you are refreshed for the rest of the week. And if you can't make it live, you can get access to all the replays in the members area. If you're listening to this podcast, I'm confident that it's a fit for you. To make it accessible for everyone, it's less than $10 a month. Plus, throughout the month of December, the cost of membership for all new moms to join the Momsiety Club will be donated to the Children's Miracle Network. I'm extending you this offer to join other moms like you around the world saying goodbye to their momsiety together. Just head to join.momsietyclub.com and click the Join the Momsiety Club membership. I can't wait to see you there. Welcome to the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, a former mental health worker with degrees in psychology and criminal justice, so I know the importance of keeping calm in a difficult situation. But when I had my kids, I found myself full of anxiety. One day, everything clicked and I made a commitment to own my anxiety so it doesn't own me. And that's why I started the Momsiety Club podcast. Each week, we'll discuss the ups, the downs, and anxieties of motherhood. So join me and let's get rid of this Momsiety together. Welcome to episode 22 of the Momsiety Club podcast. Today, you'll meet Ashley Buffa from the Freedom Moms, and our interview pairs really nicely and builds off of last week's episode, Using Realistic Self-Care to Tame Your Momsiety, as well as all the things that are going on since it is the holiday season and end of the year. So listen to this one. If you didn't listen to last week's You can listen to that one too for some great ideas on self-care during this time. Okay, there is so much going on right now to make our mom's anxiety go through the roof. I'm in Pennsylvania and over the weekend I had to stop my in-person instruction for my Pilates clients um, due to COVID restrictions. A big snowstorm is supposed to be hitting overnight. It just... Um, it has been snowing for a couple hours now as I'm recording this. Kids are in school virtually because of that, as well as just normally. And the holidays are here in full force. Things are definitely different this year. Perhaps you are enjoying some aspects, but disappointed by others um, that, that it's different. And I just want you to know that that is completely normal. Um, it can also be hard like trying to come to terms with ourselves thinking like, oh, I'm really glad that I don't have to travel to my families. Okay. What are you doing to make the best of this situation? I would love to hear. How have you been taking care of yourself? Share what you've been up to by emailing hello at momsietyclub.com, message on social media at club. Or leave a voicemail at join.momsietyclub.com. I will share it on a future episode, and it is always wonderful hearing from you. For many, Christmas is just a week away. Uh, Here, we celebrate Hanukkah, and it is already almost over. I have definitely had a few momsiety attacks due to the amount of gifts and um, everything going on. And now, that's not unusual that I would get anxious over the gifts, but uh, maintaining boundaries with um, trying to stay safe and all that, it has, it has been a little uh, challenging. So yeah, just the amount this year just seems so overwhelming because everything's come to our house since we aren't visiting family. But uh, one thing that I try to remember to do with my six-year-old is to have him donate something for each gift he receives. And it doesn't have to be anything huge. He can donate a ball he doesn't play with or a stuffed animal that has been sitting in the corner. Um, But it helps, especially as they're growing up, understanding, you know, giving back and charity and so on. So I really like that it was actually recommended to me by an acquaintance I knew and it, it's it's nice. Okay. 
Uh, just as in previous episodes, links to social media, email, and the Momsiety Club website are included in the show notes. The Momsiety Club email subscribers get a link to the latest episodes and show notes in the weekly email. So if you're not already on the list, you can get added by signing up for the free resources at join.momsietyclub.com. Also, a little reminder to subscribe in your favorite podcast app that you listen to on your phone or just tell your smart speaker to play the Momsiety Club podcast um, whenever you're ready. All right, let's dive in. As I mentioned earlier, my guest today is Ashley Buffa. She's the mother of 10 children. Yes, 10. A business owner and a dedicated non-perfectionist home systems extraordinaire. She's passionate about helping any mom who wants a change to realize and achieve a neat space that really feels like home sweet home. Well, hello, Ashley, and thank you so much for joining me today on the Momsiety Club podcast. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Well, could you just give us a little rundown? I have followed you for, I don't know how long, uh, with kind of the home management and smart kids chore system and the Freedom Moms Challenge. Um, And I thought it would be a great fit for our listeners to kind of learn some of your tips and tricks and learn more about you and uh, how you manage your (laughs) household because... I know for a lot of us moms, mess and chaos and things like that, clutter can be a real uh, provoker of anxiety. So please. Yes, for sure. Um, so I have, I have 10 children ranging in age from 18 all the way down to nine months. And that was me. <laughs> that was me 10 years ago. Um, my, my life just felt completely chaotic and kind of out of control just because basically the root of it was my house was in chaos and just out of control. And so that made life in general just feel that way. But I got to the point after having a few different epiphany moments, (laughs) I got to the point where I realized, um, you know what, it doesn't actually have to be this way it wasn't, it didn't used to be this way for moms, you know, a hundred years ago who had so many less conveniences, you know, and obviously they didn't have any technology a hundred, 200 years ago, but mm-hmm. they were somehow able to keep, you know, a clean and tiny home and their children helped with that. So, um, it was after those epiphany moments that I was like, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> it is time for this to stop. And like you said, it does, it is kind of the root of so much anxiety with moms. And I, once, once I finally got a system in place that was working for us and we were able to just keep things flowing smoothly and keep things neat and picked up, I, so much of my anxiety and worry and even just like my whole parenting attitude <laughs> changed. I suddenly was a more patient mom. Yes. I suddenly had um, a desire to like do crafts with my kids. And let me just, let me just add a, a little, um, side note there. I am not a crafty mom at all. Like I am really bad, (laughs) but it actually made me like willing to try like really, really basic stuff. Whereas before I was like, no, we're not going to do that because that's just even more a mess. And so it kind of, it changed I don't want to say it changed my personality because I'm still the same person, but it definitely changed my demeanor in general as a mom. And as, you know, as a wife, as a friend, um, just having a really strong home management system in place, it, it like, it reached into every area of my life. It was really cool. I didn't expect that. I just wanted to clean your house. (laughs) So I love how you explain that because Yes, I'm the same way with crafts (laughs) because I get that feeling now that you, you said it specifically. I'm like, yeah, that is why I'm just like, okay, we're not going to do that today. We're just going to put that off. Maybe, maybe later. And I put it (laughs) off. So that is a very good point. So as I continue on through (laughs) the system, uh, I hopefully will become craftier. (laughs) Yes. One day you'll get to the point where you're like, 
yeah, sure. We could do that. Instead of <laughs> you need to wait for your birthday. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, well, one of the things that you discuss in your, with freedom moms challenge is your survival mode. And I think we have all been in survival mode for the past year. I think new motherhood is definitely survival mode, especially when you have more than one child. And so how do you do that with 10? What is survival mode? Can you explain that to us? And, um, yeah. Okay. So freedom mom style survival mode is different than the survival mode that you think of. Um, you know, when you see funny memes on Facebook and it's not all about the messy bun and yoga pants that you've had on for five days. Like that's not actually freedom mom style survival mode. That might be somebody else's survival mode. That's not how (laughs) we do it here. So I like to call it proactive survival mode. And so basically it's covering three different things every day. So it's making sure that you're not crusty. (laughs) So, you know, like get your shower and put on some clean clothes. Um, You know, if you, if you can pull off a messy bun and be cute, then go for it. I can't do it. I don't know why. I just, I never mastered that, but whatever (laughs) it means to where basically it's, you get to yourself to the point to where if, um, if like, for instance, your pastor were to stop by and knock on the door unexpectedly you wouldn't be mortified to open the door. Like you wouldn't be hiding behind the couch. Like nobody's home. Right. Um, so it's like that level of self-care, just pull yourself together enough to where if you had an unexpected visitor, you wouldn't be mortified. And that actually came out of me having unexpected visitors like time after time after time and to like continuously being mortified. I was like, okay, I can't keep doing this. <laughs> so it, that's number one is self-care to the point that, um, you can, you, you have some pride in how you look and feel because when you, when you look good, you feel good, right. It all kind of, it, it all lends itself to, to the next step. So the next step is, um, making sure that your family members have something to put on. (laughs) Everybody has clean underwear. Everybody has clean socks. Everybody has a clean outfit. So it doesn't mean that you have to be caught up on laundry. It just means that there is still laundry in the drawer. For me, that actually does mean that I have to do one load a day because I have a million kids, but for the average size family, it probably means you have to do laundry like every third day. So, you know, when you need to do your laundry and you just make sure that it doesn't even have to be folded. It just has to be clean. Right. Right. If I can just jump in, Uh I love one of the things that you say, and that really made a big difference in my mindset because that is as well about changing our mindset. Um, is that if you get stuck switching the laundry from the washer to the dryer, if you forget it sits in there, that is your goal. If you can do that, Mm -hmm. you're, you're having some success. Yes. You're moving the needle forward. Like wherever you are right now, you know, wherever you are, you're just trying to get a little tiny bit better than what that is. And that way you are moving towards progress. So it's not about like going from mess to success overnight. Right. <laughs> Not at all. Like we're all, you know, um, so yes. So make sure that just everybody has something clean to wear. <laughs> and then the third thing is making sure that your people, your family has something to eat. Now it may be pizza and that's totally fine, but the difference is you're actually planning for it. So you're not getting to five 30 or six o'clock in the evening and saying, Oh shoot, what are we going to have? for dinner tonight and then feeling like a failure because you, you don't know. Right. Right. Deciding at 10 AM. I know that today's going to be a doozy because I was up with the baby all night last night and I'm so tired. We are going to have pizza tonight, you know? So it's a proactive decision earlier in your day, as opposed to, Oh no, it's six o'clock. I don't know what's for dinner. I guess it's pizza again. I'm a failure. (laughs) You know, so basically all three steps of survival mode are intended to give us more confidence. So you have your appearance, you feel good, you feel pulled together. You're not embarrassed by it. You have the laundry, your people have clean clothes. They might not be folded perfectly. They might not all, you might not be caught up, but your people do have something to put on. And thirdly, dinner time is not a reaction. 
you know what's happening at 10 a.m. every morning. So by 10 a.m., you say, okay, we're having pizza tonight. Or you say, okay, I'm going to pull a freezer meal out. Or you say, okay, one of my friends is actually bringing me a casserole tonight. We're having that. So, you know, it doesn't mean (laughs) that you have to spend two hours cooking (laughs) dinner. That's not what it means at all. It just means you know what you're doing. You know what you're serving. So those are the three steps to proactive survival mode. And it just makes sure that the basics are covered no matter what is going on in your life, the basics are covered. And at the end of the day, you don't feel bad about how everything went down. You have some confidence at the end of the day. And then maybe the next day, depending on how much the baby sleeps, (laughs) maybe the next day, you'll be able to do a little bit more and then a little bit more. And then it slowly builds. But as your confidence builds each day, you successfully complete those survival mode steps. You'll be surprised at how much momentum that actually creates. Mm -hmm. So how much sleep are you getting? (laughs) (laughs) I actually, I get an embarrassing amount of sleep. I get like eight and a half hours every night. So, (laughs) oh my, yeah, yeah. Okay. I am, I'm sleep pampered. (laughs) Yes. My, uh, what is he? 22 month old just decided not to sleep last night out of nowhere. And I'm like, Oh, that is rough. It's so rough when they just decide out of the blue that they're not sleeping anymore. (laughs) Yes. Well, so how many children did you have when you developed your system? Let's see. I, my sixth was a baby when the big epiphany moment that I had was when I was reading the book, Farmer Boy to my kids um, as a read aloud, we homeschool. And so I was reading through that book and you know, it's in the um, Little House on the Prairie series. And for anyone who hasn't read that one, um, they're on a farm. Um, there's four kids, four, three, I think there's four. There's four kids. They all, the kids do an unbelievable amount of farm work and they keep, they all work together. They keep the house clean. Like everything just flows beautifully. And I was reading that book and I was like, okay, Almanzo's like six and he's hand milking like five cows every morning and every night. Like, my kids are going to learn how to clean the house today. (laughs) (laughs) So, but yeah, I had six and um, my six was a baby. And I mean, it took, it took like a good year of trial and error, trial and error, but I was determined. I was like, if Almanzo's family could do this, we are going to figure that, like, I'm going to figure this out there. There's no room for failure here. Like we're going to, I will, I will fail as many times as I have to fail to figure out how to make this work in our house. So (laughs) And we did, we figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. One of the things that we had chatted about previously was kind of you developed a good chore routine for your kids near the end of your pregnancies. Yes. How did you do that? Because you were able to have some time to rest and recuperate after having your children. Is that correct? Yes, I am. I'm actually pretty militant about the la- the final weeks of pregnancy and the first six weeks afterwards, because, you know, I've had 10 children (laughs) and, um, that's not easy on the body. Like one pregnancy is rough on the body, but you know, when you start to really add those up and I decided early on, like pregnancy is not going to destroy my body. I'm just not going to let that happen. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to make sure that at the end of however many children we have, I still have a body that is fully functional and operational. Right. That, <laughs> and so, that works. <laughs> right. That actually works. Um, so yeah. And you know, I mean, the last few weeks of pregnancy are so hard. Like it just hurts, right? Mm-hmm. It's just rough stuff. Um, so I worked with a home birth midwife through my first five children. And so she was able to actually impart a lot of wisdom on, you know, the things that are harder on your body and the things that, you know, are important to make sure that you're doing. So, you know, basically in the last six weeks of pregnancy, I stop vacuuming. I stop pushing a grocery cart and I stop, um, pushing a baby stroller. And so that was kind of where I started, like, because, you know, with a million kids, the floors need to be vacuumed every day. And so that was kind of like the first chore that I was like, okay, this has to be done by someone else. Um, And so that was the first thing that I delegated. And then I was like, well, if I'm having the vacuum, I might as well have them sweep too, you know, the hardboards in the kitchen and everything. So it just kind of turned into what are the things 
that because my goal is not to have my children do every single cleaning task. My goal is to mm-hmm. work alongside my children, but I, I kind of, you know, looked, you know, obviously the bending over, you know, that hurts. So I'm not going to bend over. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do dusting that's, you know, right up here and, you know, I can wipe the windows down, but the kids are going to be the ones picking up off the floor. And, you know, when the baby, you know, tosses the toy from the high chair, they're going to be the one to go retrieve that. They're going to do the vacuuming. They're going to do the sweeping. Um, I started, (laughs) I started taking my then, I guess he probably would have been like nine years old. Um, I started taking my nine-year-old with me to the grocery store and he would push the grocery cart for me. And I still, to this day, take that same child and he's 14 (laughs) now. And he's like, we're a grocery shopping like crazy duo. Like it's amazing how (laughs) fast and efficient we are. Cause I mean, he's been doing it with me now for so long. Um, but, and then, you know, whenever we would go out, one of my bigger kids would push the stroller, the toddler in the stroller. And then because that's the stuff that you're supposed to do or not do, I should say in those last weeks of pregnancy, the same thing goes for that first six weeks postpartum Mm -hmm. when, you know, all of your pelvic floor muscles are just going back to back into, you know, the right position and, everything, it's just best to not do those activities. So, right. you know, especially the vacuuming, the pushing the stroller and pushing, pushing anything, um, yeah. the baby cart. Yeah. That just, for whatever re- reason, it's really, really taxing on those muscles. And so, you know, that just got to be kind of, my kids love it when we have a new baby, like they absolutely oh, that's good. love having yeah. a baby around. So I kind of explained to them, Hey, this is super hard on me. So if we want another baby, then that means everybody has to pitch in and really help out during the last six weeks of pregnancy and first six weeks of having that baby home. Cause I'm just not going to be able to do much. And they all have rallied and they've all, you know, whatever it takes, <laughs> you know, so, um, but avoiding those things I have found has made it so that my recoveries are so much stronger. I wouldn't say faster because I don't rush it. I just mm-hmm. don't, I don't think it's a good idea. But once I get past that first initial six weeks postpartum, my body is back where it needs to be. It's strong. You know, I can start working on rebuilding, but you know, everything is still very, very functional as far as like everything's where it's supposed to be. You wouldn't think, you know, with 10 kids that, you know, things might shift around, but they haven't because I've been so diligent with making sure to take care of myself in that, in that six weeks. So that's a great lesson. And I'm really, I think definitely for your, was it a midwife you said, or yes, yes. That she was able to tell you these things early on, um, so that you could start with your first children, because that is, I think it changes every five years or every decade or so as to what mom's supposed to be doing. You know, what a pregnant woman's supposed to be doing, what mom of a new baby is supposed to be doing when she should be back, you know, doing these crazy workouts, even if she never worked out before. (laughs) (laughs) So I am very happy that you had that great experience. And I wish that more moms had that experience. Definitely. Yeah education is key. So it really is. Sharing. It's so like, I don't know, even like within my friend group, I'm really the only person that's like really hyper vigilant about that type of thing. Um, I even, you know, after, after that first six weeks, I start going to the physical therapist to, you know, rebuild the, um, you know, the diastasis. Your diastasis recti. recti yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like applauding you here. You need to go to a physical therapist. Yeah. I mean, it's just so important. Like, yeah. why would you, I mean, I don't want a broken body. <laughs> you know? so you've got to put it back together. Um, but yeah, it is. So, it's so, so, so important because I mean, there's no reason for all of the things that our, our culture has really kind of normalized, you know, mm-hmm. like when you sneeze, you know, and you right. know, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to get graphic, but no. that's um, not normal. Like that's not, I'm the, I'm the one who talks all about that in my, okay. my first, <laughs> what kind of has turned into the mom's ID club was called babies at the bar. And it was all about safe pelvic floor and core exercises postpartum mm-hmm. and that you do with your baby. So, and 
I did pelvic floor courses, those types of things. So yes. yes. Okay, good. I'm it's a good company here. Normal. I am a like <laughs> shout out from the rooftops. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's sad to me that that is what has been normalized because it doesn't have to be that way. Like if a mom of 10 can have a fully functional pelvic core that works and does its job and keeps things where it's supposed to be right. like anyone can, right. <laughs> so, right. you know, yeah. <laughs> Well, yes. Thank you. Um, I guess, let me see, is there anything else you want to chat about quick before we do our wrap up questions? You know, I would, I just want to like on the same note as taking care of yourself after your baby's born, you know, and while your baby's young and this, the same vein of survival mode, I just want to say, I had this chat with um, some of the ladies in my membership, my freedom moms membership group um, about people's, um, you know, specifically, this was a mother-in-law's thoughts on how her daughter-in-law was handling things. And she was like, you know, well, I feel like I'm doing great, but my mother-in-law, every time she sees the house, she's like, Oh, well, you know, why don't I dust for you? It's obvious you haven't done it, you know, whatever. And so I asked her, I was like, if you're proud of yourself and the work that you're getting done, whose standard, who else's standard matters? Like, why does that, why does that matter to you? Because at the end of the day, your mother-in-law isn't the one holding down the fort in your home. You know, she's not the one that's actually responsible for your children and the way that they turn out. And, you know, if she were having to do that, she would probably, and she was really worried about the dusting and making sure everything was perfect right after having a baby, she would probably be grumpy with the kids grumpy with your husband. She would be grumpy with everybody. The baby would be stressed out because mom would be stressed out. Milk supply might drop. Like, (laughs) you know, you can't worry about other people's standards when you are in that recovery. You you shouldn't worry about it at any point in time. Like your standards for your home should be the most important, but especially, you know, when you have a new baby at home that first year, it's so precious. It goes by so fast really, you need to figure out what it is that you want your standard to be in your home for yourself, for your home, for your body, for your baby, for your children. And just focus on that because, you know, at the end of the day, as much as I, as much as I am a huge fan of clean homes and home management systems, at the end of the day, having a happy mom and having a, you know, a peaceful mom who is confident in her own abilities, Mm -hmm. that is so much more powerful to your children and to your baby than any, any amount of organization and decluttering and dusting, you know, it's just at the end of the day, it's so much more important. Those things will come, you know, once you get out of that cloud of infancy, Mm -hmm. (laughs) there's always time for that later, but, you know, being able to just have a calm and confident personality around your kids, that's the stuff that sticks. And that's the stuff that is so much more important, you know, to their development and their growth and their own comfort and confidence as little people. So I just feel that like it's so important and it's just really overlooked, I feel like in our culture. So that's a soapbox moment for you. <laughs> <laughs> We're again on the same lines. Um, and so kind of going off of that a little bit with, did you ever experience any postpartum, um, perinatal mood disorders? Um, and did having your kids helping, did that assist you? So I definitely experienced, um, the average baby blues. It got to the point, like I knew exactly which day it would start postpartum. And when I would start feeling the light at the end of the tunnel, which was always around six weeks for me, um, it was never to the point where, um, I needed to talk to my doctor or midwife about it. It was always just, you know, the, you know, feeling overwhelmed, feeling a little bit weepy. Um, but it wasn't ever to the point where I needed help for it, but it did get to the, like, because I knew so specifically when it would start and when it would stop, I was able to tell myself, yeah, this is part of it. This is part of my postpartum journey. I know that everything's okay. And, you know, it helped to know when it was going to start to feel better. Yes. Yeah. You know, that knowing that this was not my new life. (laughs) Right. I think that is super helpful. Very challenging for first time moms. Yes. Um, 
and I can't, I can't say with more experience than two children, but I know I was like, you know, going into <laughs> having my second, I was like, I know what it's going to be like, but yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. That it's was- different every time. Like seriously, it's like, wow. Well- Right. I don't remember this as well as I thought I did. <laughs> right. <laughs> but knowing that there is the light of the end of the tunnel, and that is kind of what yes. this podcast and the club is about is, you know, hearing that we've been there. You are not alone. It yes. will get better. So <laughs> you're going to get through it. It's going to get better. It's going to start feeling better soon. You just have to, and you know, for some, for some moms, you know, having the cleaner house and the cleaner environment is a huge help, Mm -hmm. but to other moms who maybe, you know, didn't have systems in place prior to having the baby, it would just be, that can add the overwhelm. It can add to the overwhelm. So for that mom, I would say, Hey, don't worry about it. Like in six weeks, you'll be feeling better physically, emotionally. And then you can start looking at getting things picked up and put together. But right now, like you don't need to do anything that doesn't feel good. Mm-hmm. You know, if it feels good to grab a rag and start wiping smudges off of the walls, then go for it. But if that just makes you feel, you know, like you're failing or like, you know, Adding any sort more of thing, overwhelm, right? then that's not for you right now. It'll be for you. It'll be there. Those smudges will still be there in two yeah. months. Like, don't worry about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're not going anywhere. So, <laughs> right. Well, one of the, the things that I really promote and love to ask guests is self-care and really realistic self-care. Um, because as we were talking about postpartum culturally, uh, culturally self-care, I think is going to, you know, is pushed as going to the spa, but that is right. not going to happen for a mom, right. new mom. <laughs> and that's not going to happen right now with <laughs> the world mm-hmm. we're living in. So what's yes. some realistic self-care that you've done for yourself today or this week? So I, I do, I take self-care really, really seriously because I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very determined not to lose myself in motherhood mm-hmm. to maintain my own personhood. <laughs> And so I always, you know, showering every day is a non-negotiable and really that isn't even self-care, right? I mean, that's just like basic human needs, but for some, if you're not there yet, you know, that's, that's definitely Sometimes that, that is, you got to take the wins where you can. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I would say, you know, that's a great place to start. If you just need a starting point is taking that shower every day. And for me, I, I get a lot of enjoyment out of makeup. I just love it a lot of women don't. So, you know, if that's not your thing, then you shouldn't, you should not push yourself to do something that just doesn't even matter to you. Mm -hmm. But I would say just, just when I look in the mirror, if I'm like, Oh, cute today, that's good enough for me. You know? So I, when I look in the mirror, I want to be like, huh, I look like I'm doing this, you know, instead of like, Oh no, I look like I'm 50. (laughs) So, um, that's a big part for me. So I take the time every morning, you know, I, I don't have a ton of clothes because, you know, I homeschool even before COVID, I was a homeschool mom. And so I'm not out like a lot. So I have basically like three to four outfits that I think are super cute that I feel comfortable and confident in. And so, you know, I just, you know, recycle those three to Mm -hmm. four outfits. And so I always feel cute and put together. That to me is a huge boost to me. And the other thing that I found that is really kind of funny, I do not consider myself an outdoors person at all. Like, even as a kid, I was like, I'll just stay in here and read. Thanks. (laughs) Me too. I'm like, I don't want to take you out. Yeah, I know. It's like, (laughs) ew. Um, But I have found that being outside for just like 15 to 30 minutes a day for me is the biggest mood boost. Yes. It's just weird considering I just don't even like being outside. It's crazy how just stepping outside for, you know, 15 to 30 minutes, that is, that's huge self-care. And I mean, that's something you can just go sit, you know, you don't have to even do anything, just go sit outside and it just the fresh air and the sun, even though I'm like slathered in sunscreen or sitting in the shade, <laughs> I have really fair skin, <laughs> um, but it does. That's like, and that's just something that I've discovered in the last year and a half is that just being outside for a little bit each day, it really, it kind of revives me. I don't know. Well, since you did homeschool, but I don't know if we were all took for granted just 
that outside time of going to the car or driving yes. to work or to the grocery store and being, yeah. you know, that definitely, because I, I have definitely the last year and a half as well gone, this is, I need to step outside. Yeah, I just, <laughs> I need to go outside for a little bit. <laughs> and I just want to say, because the video, we're talking on Zoom on video for the listeners who obviously can't see. Uh, with your self-care. Yes, you're perfectly put together. Your hair is done (laughs) in a nice outfit and your room is like pristine and decorated. And I'm in my office that is our staging room since we moved two years ago with nothing on the wall, not painted yet in my (laughs) workout clothes. So... (laughs) It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Whatever works. <laughs> I changed out of my pajamas. That is my getting ready. That's your win. <laughs> that Take is it. My win. <laughs> right. Um, well, what advice would you give to yourself? You're you're still relatively a new mom with a nine month old. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of. I guess what advice did you learn from child to child that really stuck with you along the way? Yeah. When I, when I finally figured out that it didn't matter how many children I would have, but it would feel like I was a brand new mom who had never done this before with each child. Um, really the only thing that I have gotten like super proficient with, um, with newborns is like the clipping fingernails. Like that's the one thing that I can be like, yes, I have, I can clip fingernails no matter which what newborn it is. Like I can just do that because like, even with diapering, you think like as many diapers as I've changed, you know, diapering a newborn is totally different than diapering a toddler. Very much right. So, I mean, yes. Cause they don't, they can't help you. They don't know like what they're doing. You know what I mean? So it's like, wait a minute, this is weird, but clipping nails is the one thing that I've gotten really good at <laughs> that, that does transfer, but everything else like personality, um, milestones, how I feel, how I recover, you know, like all of that stuff. It's so, so different from child to child. And so instead of thinking, I'm going to get better at this as I go along the baby stage, I mean, like the other stuff, like I've totally, I've got it. I've got it down now, (laughs) but like the baby stuff I do, I feel like there's just been a reset button each Mm -hmm. time. So if, if I was the kind of person that would beat myself up, like, I should know this by now. I shouldn't still be getting peed on when I'm changing a newborn diaper. Like how many times have I done, you know, if I were the kind of person that would beat myself up, you know, that would be awful because I do like, I'm, I'm a bumbling idiot (laughs) at the beginning of every new baby. So, you know, just, just realizing like, this really is a brand new experience each time. It's a new person who's never done this before you know, both you and the baby, basically Mm -hmm. you have two people that don't know what they're doing, you know? So just giving yourself so much grace with all of it and learning to laugh every time some, instead of like crying, you know, it was the the saying, um, there's no use crying over spilt milk. When I really learned to, um, kind of make that like a life mantra for myself, Mm -hmm. it helped so much. Like there's, no reason to cry when you accidentally put your baby's onesie on backwards. You know, there's no reason to cry when you get peed on again, there's no reason to cry. You know, if, if your toddler spills, spills his cup, you know, like there's no reason to get frustrated because that is life. And I think once I really started like just building that into my day, like, Oh no, you spilled your milk. Let's clean it up. (laughs) You know, like that type of thing. And that's kind of, that's how I treat myself. And that's how I treat my kids now. It's like life happens constantly. So let's give ourselves like a ton of grace and try to be more careful next time, but you never know what's going to happen. So just right. go with I the flow. That is, that is wonderful advice. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful advice. Um, well, how can listeners find out more about you if they're interested in learning about the Freedom Moms and all your different programs? where should they go? So freedommoms.com is my website and it has links to all the different programs. Um, I'm also on Instagram. I'm, I'm pretty active on Instagram and I'm pretty active on Facebook. Um, and the links for that are on freedommoms.com. Um, but yeah, I hope you come and join us because we just have a nice community of women that are just trying to do a little bit better than they did yesterday. (laughs) 
Yes, definitely. Well, thank you so much for your time and sharing your story. Thank Thank you. you. (laughs) Thank you, Ashley, for joining me today. I'm interested in hearing what you think about survival mode. Share what survival mode means to you in an email to hello at momsietyclub.com, a message on social media to at momsietyclub, or leave a voicemail at join.momsietyclub.com, and I'll share it on a future episode because it's always wonderful hearing from you. As a reminder, while many can have similar experiences postpartum, um, and there is a central theme that we can all relate to, everyone's postpartum journey is different, and even an individual's postpartum can be different from child to child. To learn more about perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, what's normal, what to look out for, and when to speak to a professional, please check out episode nine with where I interview women's health psychiatrist, Dr. Nazanin Silver, as well as episode 16 with licensed therapist and couples counselor, Amber Holly. And if you check through the different episodes on your podcast app, uh, the titles will kind of tell you who I'm interviewing and what types of things that they were going through. So if you feel like you're not relating to a specific person's interview, you can scroll through and I'm sure you will find somebody who has had the exact same feelings uh, and things going on for themselves or thoughts that you have and reach out to me. You can reach out anonymously or um, you can also post anonymously in the Momsiety Club membership, which is a great place. The Momsiety Club membership is full of a group of amazingly supportive moms and pre and postnatal fitness tips and exercises to help you mentally and physically. And the first month's fee for all new members this month is being donated to the Children's Miracle Network. When you're ready to join other mamas getting through the ups, downs, and anxieties of motherhood, head to join.momsietyclub.com to become a member and check out the year-end sale going on for working with me individually, either via a vent session, a one-on-one pre- and postnatal session, or a combo of both plus access to the Momsiety Club in the Ultimate Momsiety Relief Package. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you for listening. Remember remember to subscribe to get the latest episodes downloaded to your phone and head to join.momsietyclub.com and leave a voicemail about what realistic self-care you are taking for yourself at the end of this year and during the holiday season. And if you're not on our email list yet, you can get added by signing up for the free resources at join.momsietyclub.com. And lastly, please share the podcast with a mom friend. It's always great to learn that we are not alone. All right, now let's go get rid of this momsiety. The Momsiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK.